hi all today we are going to discuss about what is a motor unit so last class we have discussed about what is a sarcomere and how the normal muscle contractions are happening so now we are going to discuss about how the muscle contractions are actually happening so last class we discussed that there will be some muscular stimulations that is happening to the sarcomere to carry out that particular muscular contraction so today we are going to learn about how the motor impulses are transmitted to that to that particular sarcomere so that whole particular unit or the whole segment which carries the impulse and which causes the muscle contraction is what basically known as a muscular a motor unit so this is the basic organization of a motor unit so this is what the spinal cord cross section so there will be a spinal cord cross section from that there will be some dorsal nerves which is coming to the sarcomere so once the nerve impulse from the spinal cord which is carried by the peripheral nerves reaches the sarcomere or the muscular region then the proper muscular contractions are basically happening so this is the cross section of spinal cord so when we discuss about spinal cord there are multiple levels of spinal cord from each level the peripheral nerves will be arriving so this is the cross section of spinal cord and this is known as the ventral part and this is and this is known as the <coughs> dorsal part and this is what known as the ventral part so the motor nerves are arriving from the ventral horn of the spinal cord so this is the basic organization of a motor unit <coughs> so once the impulses which is carried either from the brain or from the spinal cord arrives at the ventral root it will be transmitted through the ventral root to the peripheral muscles so once the impulses reach the peripheral nerve then the things which we discussed in the last class that is the cross bridging will be happening and the muscle contractions will be occurring so these are the basic structures which are involved in the motor unit there will be a spinal root there will be motor nerves and there will be muscular unit so all these three together will form a motor unit so the motor unit consists of alpha motor neuron and all the muscle fibers it innervates so this is the alpha motor neuron and the muscles which are innervated by that particular alpha motor neuron so all of these structures are the basic components of motor unit the stimulus that the muscle fibers receives initiating the contractor process is tra transmitted through an alpha motor unit neuron the cell body of the neuron is located in the ventral horn of the spinal cord the nerve cell axon extends from the cell body to the muscle where it divides into either few or as many as thousands of smaller branches each of the small branches terminates in a motor end plate that lies in close approximation to the sarcoderma of the single muscle fiber so uh, as i said this is the alpha motor neuron so there will be some impulses either from the brain or from the spinal cord which is arriving at the dorsal horn of the spinal cord so as i said in the spinal cord we have anterior portion and the posterior portion so in the ventral portion or the dorsal or the ventral portion so in the dorsal portion there is the cell body of the motor neuron so this is the basic cell body of the motor unit so once the impulses reach the cell body it will be transmitted or it will pass that particular impulse to the peripheral alpha motor neuron and the alpha motor neuron carries the impulse to the sarcoderma so what's the uh, peculiar characteristics which the alpha motor neuron has is that the alpha motor alpha motor neuron will be dividing into multiple segments to supply each of the sarcoderma which is present in that particular muscle so if it is a large group of muscle or if it is if it is a muscle which consists of a large number of sarcoderma then the alpha motor neuron will be dividing into multiple numbers to innervate all the sarcoderma and if the muscle is consisted of a small number of sarcoderma then it will be divided only to a particular number so that's the difference between smaller and larger motor unit <coughs> so motor unit 
are basically in different size so there is no proper size so there is no proper shape for that particular motor unit it depends on the size of motor a uh, size of motor neuron cell body diameter of the axle and the number of muscle fibers and the type of muscle so the basic size and shape or basic structure of motor unit is depends on the number of motor neurons which is uh, arriving number of motor neuron alpha, alpha motor neurons which are arriving from the spinal cord and number of the muscles which need to be supplied or muscle number of sarcolemmas which needs to be supplied so uh, according to this number according to the say according to the size and according to the shape there can be different types of motor unit as i said there can be smaller motor unit and there can be larger motor unit so it basically depends on the number of sarcolemma which need to be supplied by the alpha motor neuron and with the safe uh, size and shape of the cell body which is present on the dorsal horn of spinal cord so these are the factors which is determining the characteristics of each type of motor unit so nerve impulse will take longer to travel through small diameter axons than to the large diameter axon so as you can see in this picture so if it is a large diameter motor axon, uh, axon that means if the diameter is more then the impulses will be carrying smoothly and rapidly and if it is a small diameter motor neuron then the amount of transmission to that particular area will be limited or it will be sluggish when it's compared to the larger motor unit so that's one of the drawback for this smaller motor unit but in some areas of a human body there is a need of smaller motor unit there is no need of actual large motor unit also it depends on the function of that particular area which need to be done if you are discussing about large group of muscles so we have our large group of muscles we have biceps triceps and all the large group of muscles the lower limb muscles all the large group of muscles need larger diameter motor unit the reason is that this is the large group of muscles it needs to be supplied by larger diameter motor unit because there should be a rapid firing of the nerve impulse one and there should be a continuous firing of motor impulse and if you're discussing about face facial muscles or all the small muscles which we have in our body the muscles in our hand all the small muscles actually doesn't need the larger diameter motor units for that particular muscles or for that particular regions there is a there's only a need of small motor unit fibers so that's the reason why we have different size and different shape motor unit in our body so all the motor units or all the size and shape of motor unit it depends on the amount of impulse which needs to be carried throughout the body or the amount of or the number of muscles which need to be supplied by that particular nerve or particular motor neuron so in small diameter unit a stimulus will take longer to reach the muscle fibers than it in a larger diameter axon so as i said if it is a larger axon <coughs> then the impulses will be traveling in a faster and in a rapid action mode and if it if it comes to a smaller diameter axon then the amount of transmission will be sluggish when it compared to other larger group of motor units so as i said earlier the size of motor unit is basically determined by the muscle fibers which need to be supplied by that particular motor axon so one of the example which we can found in our human body is the the sciatic muscle a sciatic sorry the sciatic nerve the sciatic nerve itself got a large diameter when it compared to other nerves in our human body especially our facial nerves so all the facial nerves are very small in diameter when compared to the sciatic nerve in the lower limb so the sciatic nerve itself got a large diameter it basically because it needs to be supplied it needs to supply a larger group of lower limb muscles so that's the reason why it got a larger diameter when compared to other muscle other nerves so the facial nerves which got a smaller diameter axon only got a function 
to stimulate a smaller region or a smaller group of muscle. So the muscles that control fine movements or uh, are used to make small adjustments have small motor unit. Such motor units generally have small cell bodies and small diameter axon. So the facial the best example is the facial muscles or the facial muscles which is supplied by facial nerve or by the uh, muscles of our head region uh, nerves of head region so all of these nerves got a small diameter axons so basically it because it only needs to be supplied by the basic function of all these small diameter axon is to carry out some small functions or to carry out some minute functions as compared with other neurons in our human body muscles that are used to produce large increments of force and large movements usually have a predominance of large motor unit and large cell bodies and large diameter axons so as I, as I said they are sciatic nerve so sciatic nerve itself got a large diameter axon and got large diameter cell body to meet the function to produce large amount of force in the muscles which are supplied by that particular nerve so as you can see in these two pictures so this is a small diameter unit and this is a large diameter unit so the large diameter unit got it got a large axon and it needs to be supply many fibers primarily type 2 fibers we will be discussing about the type 1 and type 2 fibers in uh, in shortly and recruit it needs to produce a large amount of force so that's a basic function of large motor unit and when it comes to small motor unit the basic function is to carry out some small um, minute actions so it only got a small diameter axon and it basically supply only a small number of motor or the muscle fibers and next how the recruitments are actually happening so as I said all the muscle contractions or all the sarcolemia activities are happening because of this motor impulse and now we need to understand how the motor impulse producing this particular muscular contractions or oh, what is the basic principle behind this motor unit recruitment and so it is actually called size principle of motor unit recruitment uh, this is uh, with this we can explain how the basic motor recruitments are happening why we have some small motor units and why we have some large motor unit so as the name suggests the size principle determines according to the size and shape of each areas which need to be supplied by that particular axon the axon will produce some similar activities or oh, make it much more simple when we need only a small amount of muscular action if we need only a small fine movements then only small or the uh, smaller motor units will be recruited if we need to achieve a high force or if we need to conduct a high force activities then there will be large motor units will be recruited so as the principle state when an isometric muscle action is desired the motor units with the small cell bodies and few motor fibers are recruited first by the nervous system and then as force increase the larger units are recruited so if you need to carry a small functions uh, that means if you need to uh, go for some hand movements or some facial movements so all of these movements are all of these movements requires only a small amount of force so when we need to conduct a small action then the smaller motor units will be recruited as the force demand increases so as i said when we need to carry a large force activities such as walking or running so all of these activities need a large force production so when that situation arrives then the large motor units will be recruited so one of the uh, peculiar characteristics which can be obtained from this particular principle is the energy conservation we don't need to spend 
too much of energy by by recruiting larger motor units for some smaller activities what are the factors that can affect this muscle tension so muscle te tension is nothing but the amount of force or amount of basic contraction which are occurring in the muscle so first one is the number of muscle fibers how much is the number of muscle if there is a high amount of muscle fiber then there will be a higher amount of recruitment needs to be happen so that's a one factor that can determine the muscular uh, tension second one the diameter of axon if the diameter is high if, if there is a high diameter then the amount of force production will be high and the tension will be high in that particular muscle and if the diameter is small then everything the force production will be small and the tension which is produced by that particular muscle also will be small next the number of motor units which are actually firing at the same time so if there is a thousand motor unit and only one or two are functioning at the time of muscle firing then there will be there only be a small amount of muscle forces and if if large number of motor units are firing fired du during that particular activity then there will be a large group of muscles will be stimulated and that can implement or that can have some effect on muscular tension then next is the frequency of motor unit firing how frequently the motor units are getting fired if it is only fired once then the tension will be smaller after that uh, firing and if there is a continuous motor unit firing then the tensions will be maintained or tensions will be increasing over time so these are the factors that can influence a muscle tension so these are the basic factors that can cause or that can change the basic muscle recruiting pattern and these are the basic motor units that can have some effect on motor uh, uh, the force production or the muscular contractions next so now we have discussed how the muscle contractions are happening in later classes we have discussed about what are the structures that is involved in the contraction of muscle now we have discussed how the muscle contractions are actually happening or what are the basic structures that are involved in that muscular contraction so next we are going to discuss based on this particular information which we have discussed now that the motor unit and the structures which are involved in that particular muscular contractions we can classify the muscle according to its function or according to its characteristics so these fiber types are distinguished from one another histochemically metabolically morphologically and mechanically so even though we discuss muscle as a whole we cannot actually uh, see some common uh, similarities among this muscle so all of these muscles each of muscle got its own characteristics or it's got it, its own um, functions so if you look into the extremities muscles which are present in our extremities are entirely different from the muscles which are present in our spinal cord so in the spinal cord muscles uh, if you look for the spinal cord muscles all of the spinal cord muscles got only uh, small diameter and it got it is not that bulky type muscles which are present in the spinal cord and if you discuss in the extremity muscles that means if you discuss about the muscles which are present in upper limb or in lower limb all of these muscles got a bulk and the shape will be different and the basic color will be different and these are the some characteristics which we looking to classify these muscles so if you look metabolically how the energy obtained for the muscular force contractions or if you look morphologically what are the basic characteristics which we can be found when we are looking for looking that particular muscle its color and its shape and its uh, blood supply and how the blood supplies are happening the number of capillaries all of these factors are the one which determine what type of muscle actually that or how the muscle contractions are happening so all of these factors 
got some influence of muscle structures so according to all of these functions we can classify the muscle into three type type 1 type 2 a and type 2 b also known as type 2 x so these are the three types of muscles uh, under which we can classify our whole body muscles so type 1 is also known as slow twitching muscle type 2 a is known as intermediate twitching muscles and type 2 b or type 2 x is also known as fast twitching muscles so these are the three types of muscles which we can be found in our human body type 1 type 2 a and type 2 b type 1 is also known as slow twitching so twitch is something but uh, uh, basically twitch means uh, how fast our body will get fatigue due to that particular thing so if you look into this type 1 muscle it is a very it got only really very low fatigue rate and type 2 a got some fatigue rate and type 2 b got high fatigue rate so uh, uh, how you can exactly determine these three types of muscles are basically if you're looking for a long marathon person so the all the long marathon persons bodies are very lean they are not bulkier they are not heavier when compared to a short sprint athletes so the long distance in the body of a long distance marathon there will be a high amount of type 1 muscle and if you're looking for a short sprint athlete in his body type 2 will be type 2b will be higher when compared to other person so these are the basic three types of muscles which can be found in a human body so in this classification system which is almost common system for human skeletal muscle firing fiber typing the myofibrillar atbs activities under varying acidic and alkali conditions used to lineate fiber type so as i said basic energy requirement for carrying out some particular function is the primary criteria which determined to classify into these three categories so as i said in earlier classes atp is the basic energy which required to carry out a muscular contraction so this amount of atp is which is required for all of the uh, all of the activities are the primary one which is determining the type of muscular uh, types of muscle in type 1 the ATP ACE is actually produced by oxidative activity. In type 2 A is also there is some amount of glycolytic activity and some amount of oxidative activity. But in type 2 B only glycolytic activities are the one which is causing which is producing that amount of ATP which required to our human body. So whenever we discussed about the energy production there are multiple systems in your body which are producing the ATPs which are required for muscular contraction. So basically uh, how the things goes is like when if you are carrying out some function the primary energy which is obtained from our human body is from glycolytic activities. That means there are some amount of glucose which are stored in our human body from our food. So that glucose will be utilized to produce that atps which are required for a short period of time so once the glucose which are already stored in our body are depleted then there will be oxidative system so there will be oxidative cycles that will be producing energies so uh, first one is glycolytic cycle we call it as glycolysis next once the glycolysis over then there will be some other cycles will be producing the required amount of energy so that's why called as Krebs cycle I hope that you will be having a class about all this in physiology so no need to confuse about that so the glycolytic activity is basically the activities which is carried by the glucose which are already stored in our human body there is no need of production of any other energy sources so the glycolytic activities which are basically utilizing the stored glucose in our body but when it comes to a long distance the or when it comes to a endured activity then 
there need to be some new production of energy because the glucose which is stored in our human body are not sufficient to meet a long term process so there will be some other cycles or there will be some other process which will be producing that the required amount of atps during that particular activities so that's what called as krebs cycle so these are the basic atp production system in our human body so in first one the early fatigue one in the type 2 the glycolytic activities will be the one which is giving the energy that means the already stored glucose are the one which is producing the required amount of energy but when it comes to a long term activities then they need to be some system which will be continuously producing the required amount of energy in our human body so these are the basic uh, properties which we are looking to looking when we are classifying these three muscles so these are the basic characteristics which we can be found in all these three muscle bodies so as you can see in this so type 2 b or type 2 x is also known as fast glycolytic that means already produced glucose are the one which is producing this particular muscle action that means glycolytic as, it, as the name suggests glycolytic the process which will be uh, lighting the glucose so that's what type 2b and type 2a is fast oxidative glycolate this is also glycolytic but there are some oxidative process also happening to produce that required amount of oxygen then type 1 is slow oxidative that means only small amount of energy required by glycolytic activity whereas stored will be produced by oxidative that means there are some other cycles that means Krebs cycle are happening in your human body to give the enough amount of energy during that particular activity so when we look into the characteristics the diameter will be small in slow oxidative that's the reason why the long marathon runners got a skinny or the <coughs> or a skinny skeletal body but it come when it comes to a fast uh, sprint athletes they got a bulkier body because their muscles got a larger diameter and when it comes to muscular color in type 1 and type 2 a it will be red that means there are continuous blood circulation to that particular muscle to give a proper oxygen 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 throughout the activity so it will be in red in color but when it comes to type 2 b or type 2 x it will be whitish it doesn't mean that it's in pure white but the reddish will be smaller and capillaries will be dense to give more muscle uh, to give more blood supply to that particular muscle and in type 2 x it will be sparse so there will be only limited amount of capillaries and myoglobin which is carrying oxygen will be high in type 1 and type 2 a but it's very low in type 2 b speed of contraction will be slow and it will be fast in other two system rate of fatigue how easily the muscle can go for uh, fatigue it will be very slow in type 1 and as it progress there can be a fast fatigue in glycolytic muscle or in type 2 x group of muscle so all our skeletal body all the muscles in our human body are composed of either combination of all these three fibers or predominantly one type of muscle so if you look into deltoid or the bulkier muscles it is a combination of both type 2 and type 1 approximately 50 50 percent will be there so based because of that we are able to carry out a heavier load activities and also we are able to sustain that for a particular amount of time but if you look for skeletal muscles so if you are looking for a muscle which need to be contracted for a long period of time like the soleus muscle which is present in our lower body it got 80 percentage of type 1 fiber because it needs to resist a fatigue to carry out the function for a long period of time so it is a it is made up of type 1 fiber predominantly so based on this function or based on this particular cat as i said this because of the composition we can classify this muscle into either stability or a mobility muscle so the stability muscles are the one which are mainly 
required to carry out that function for a long period of time among the in those muscles the type 1 fibers will be predominant the main reason for that is, is to prevent fatigue or to sustain that amount of muscular contraction for a long period of time so because of this type 1 fibers it is able to carry out the sustained activity for a long period of time because of this particular characteristics that the type 1 fibers are fatigue resistant we can carry out that function for a long period of time so if you look into all the spinal muscles or uh, all the muscles which are required to uh, produce contractions for a long period of time are predominantly consist of this type 1 fibers so all of those muscles are known as stability or postural muscle next is mobility muscles so the mobility or the non postural muscles are mainly to carry out some actions if you are flexing your elbow joint that's a one function which need to be done by this mobility muscle so it mainly consists of type type 2 fibers so the uh, basic function of mobility muscles is to carry out that function within a short period of time so the type 2 fibers will be the one which will be acting on do acting that particular time so because of that because of this type 2 fibers it will be able to produce high velocity muscular contractions than type 1 fibers so these are the basic two uh, classification which can be done according to the type of fibers which are the which are consisted by that particular muscle so these are the two type of classification so that can be concluded so in this class we have discussed about what is the motor unit and what are the what are the basic structures which are involved in motor unit and what are the things that can determine the motor unit and how what are the factors that can be involved in the motor unit recruitment and how the motor unit recruitments are basically happening and what are the factors that is affecting muscular tensions and then what are the muscle fiber types there are three types and how each of these are uh, differentiated from one another so i hope that you will be able to understand this oxidative and non-oxidative type of energy production once you are familiar with the cycle so we will be discussing and if there is a need that if still you have doubt in energy production then we will have a discussion on the basic cycles that are producing energy system